We're on camera. So. <laughs> um, but what we're going to do here is just we're going to do some uh, some our traditional meeting stuff real quick, and that is we have vendors here. So who, well, let me set it up first. For the next 55 minutes or so, we're going to do. He and I are going to go through question and answers. Uh, got a lot of stuff that pertains from his wisdom in in baseball and life to how does that pertain to being entrepreneurs uh, and realtors, and it coincides very well. Um, but and then after that, for the a half hour after that, we're going to get back in that line <laughs> and finish what we started there. And he'll be out of line because he always is. <laughs> <laughs> Like that, that was a good one right there. <laughs> so, um, so we'll get into that. But first, uh, after well, after this, there's a lunch at the office, and there'll be a mega agent mastermind. I hope you all go and and listen and provide input. But first, Mark, come on up and tell us. Give us a 60 second. Oh, uh, uh, he's providing lunch today, and that's not the only reason he's here. He's actually he's a great teammate of of our company. And just so you guys know, my wife was a real estate agent. And she, she had to she had to leave because we traveled all over the United States playing baseball and it was just so hard for her to do it, but she was real estate, so I uh, I told her I would tell you guys that today. <laughs> You've done good, Ron. Thank you. You you shall be proud. You heard it, right? I heard it. What? Well, good morning everybody. So Mark from Minnesota title. Yes, we are the lunch sponsor, but we, are, uh, we service both residential and commercial industry out in the 13 county metro area. And uh, we are well known for our exceptional customer service and a dedicated uh, team for your closings, which creates a lot of efficiencies and faster closing times. So uh, I'll be back in the back table and I got some candy from Halloween, so come get it because I don't want to bring it home. Other than that, hopefully we'll be able to see you at lunch. Thank you. Thanks, nice. Mark. Thanks. Jason, come on up. Now, now the party's going to start. Now the party's going to start. Uh, thank you. Um, my name's Jason. Thank you. I know you guys, did, nobody came here to hear me speak today, but maybe you came to hear me sing. Um, uh, we are Cinch. We are your preferred home warranty company. We love partnering with you guys. Not only are home warranties um, a great risk management tool for your clients to protect them, they're also there to protect you. Uh, if you work with buyers and they find out that uh, owning a house means things go wrong, they want to blame somebody, if you don't have a home warranty company to call, they're going to call and blame you. So let me be uh, the, the, the person in between you and your client's problems. Um, briefly, I know it'll be short today, but I wrote a little jingle. Uh, the more you participate, um, the bigger my marketing budget. So sing, <laughs> sing along at the end like your next meal depends on it because it might. Uh, but I'm going to get to the end, and all I want to do is get, do you guys remember me when the time comes? It might be a week from now, a month from now, three months from now, you're sitting at your client's dinner table, and you go, who's that home warranty guy? Uh, come on back. If you scan this QR code and download my business card, I'm going to be giving away a Google Nest. But I'm going to ask you in about 18 seconds, I say, when you're in a pinch, your line is call Cinch. That's all I want you to think is when you're in a pinch, call Cinch. So here's kind of market update with me right now. Well, your buyers are freaking cause the fridge is old. The furnace is creaking, it's about to get cold. But the sellers aren't budging cause the market's insane. When you're in a pinch, call Sage. She said, when you're in a pinch, call Sage. Call me, thank you for coming out. <laughs> All right, Gordon, your turn. I thought he was going to sing What a Wonderful World. <laughs> All right, well, that was beautiful. Thank you very much. I uh, just want to say one of the other things we were going to start with were honoring cappers and, and profit share. But after the, the Q&A early on, we uh, pretty much everyone decided they really want to hear from him. Um, and not me, I don't understand that. <laughs> uh, but one of the things we're also doing is um, we're going to have a contest on when you have a picture with Gardy, we want you to post it on your social media and we want you to tag our brokerage. Just tag KW Preferred. It's a great way of telling all your sphere that you're out here learning. Uh, you're hanging out with cool people <laughs> and Gardy. <laughs> That's why he got released right there. <laughs> 
I'll, we could talk about failure today. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah, it just says so much. And of course, it promotes the brokerage too. Um, let me preface it. Why? Uh, God bless you. She's got three in a row. There we go. <laughs> three up, three down. Uh, so why Guardy? Um, uh, I usually don't try to um, find people from my past and have them come in here to learn. Should we, should we go with the microphones? You should. I right. really think you should. Thank you. As long as you don't sing. Uh, oh. <laughs> Big guy, just talk louder. All right, I'll talk louder. <laughs> um, but when I was playing, I didn't have the pleasure to play. It's not about me, but I just want to give you the background. I didn't have the actual pleasure to have him as a manager. However, a couple of things my dad said when he watched how Ron <laughs> operated and how he cared about people uh, and how he led people, he's like, emulate that man. So he is the guy I emulate and try to be, for the most part, <laughs> in our office for you and with you. So learning from him is a massive, awesome undertaking for me. So I hope you get as many wonderful nuggets that you can apply to your career and your life. Um, Gardy spent, we'll just get right into it. He spent 13 years as a Twins manager, but before that he was 11 years with the Twins uh, as a coach, as a third base coach. And Gardy, if you don't mind, I'd like to start with this. Uh oh. It's not bad, I promise. Okay. All, the bad, all the bad stuff is over. <laughs> well, we'll see. Latroy did give me one message to, to oh, say today. <laughs> but the 1991 World Series. I'd like to start on a great note. It's the 35th anniversary, which is your number. Yes. So there's a lot of synergy there. Um, what made that particular group of individuals and organizations so special? Um, it, it, honestly, you know, you talk about being a family, the 87, you all here? 87 uh, and the 91 clubs. And I, I didn't, I got, I got traded over to the Twins in 87, was in spring training with them. I really didn't get traded, I got pushed over there. Uh, and and uh, I was in camp with them, and I realized that year, it was totally different than the spring trainings I had with the Mets. Uh, PK ran a tight ship, they had fun, there was a lot of really fun guys and really athletic guys, and it was just so much different than I'd been with the New York Mets system. Uh, so I, I, I'll never ever forget that, and then 91, of course, becoming the third base coach, under Tom Kelly, who was a great third base coach, and he told me that a thousand times that he was a great third base coach. <laughs> and I heard a lot of things from TK in the dugout in the Metrodome, and a lot of it started with what the, when I'm waving runners home or not waving them home. So took a beating, but TK, special, special person, and uh, a good friend of mine too, still. Well, for 91, for all them to, you know, for all you guys to get to the pinnacle and win it all, you were in last place the year before. What can you say to mindset as a group? What did that group collectively do? Or who instigated it? How do you feel it all came about? Who over helped over, how did you overcome that big obstacle of we stunk and this is who we're gonna be? How did you get from low to high? Well, Andy McPhail put together during the off season, brought in pitching and uh, we were healthy. We stayed healthy pretty much the whole year. And you have Kirby Puckett, Ken Herbeck, all those guys kind of running the show. Dan Gladden out there with his hair flying all over the place. <laughs> but these guys gave it to each other in the clubhouse all day long as to the point where that's when I would go down and sit in the, du in the dugout and wait for BP to start because I didn't want to get caught up in all the wars going on. But it was a lot of trash talking and a lot of fun. And that group pulled for each other and had each other's back the whole year in 91. It was unbelievable. We had some great streaks. And still, it, it's not like anybody's nervous, no nervous, no, no nothing. We played Toronto, uh, beat them. And, and I'm telling you, the guys were so loose and having so much fun. And that's what made it really fun for us. Uh, winning the World Series was really cool. Standing there with Gene Larkin at third base and, and telling him, you know, or, or Gene Larkin at the plate, Danny Gladden standing next to me, telling me, <coughs> 
you're going to tell me when to go? I'm like, Danny, glad you're standing third base. There's only one place to go. That's the only place. And I was having to yell at him because you couldn't hear. And, and Danny was panicking. And I'm going, here's a guy that's been around a long time. So book him Dano. Don't even talk to me about book him Dano. He was scared to death at third base, about as much as I was, because I don't want to screw something up. But he was screaming at me, you're going to tell me when to go. And I'm like, it's a fly ball. Just run. Just go home. And that's what happens. <laughs> Sorry. I lose it sometimes. <laughs> I think you lost it a while ago. Uh, probably so. <laughs> That's okay. Yeah, probably so. Well, bring us, if you don't mind, bring us through the mindset like, uh, okay, let's have a Gene Larkin, let's say. So Gene, when I've, I've talked to him about it, he said when he walked up, for the, if those who don't know, Gene Larkin came up to the play, the base is loaded, in the great, one of the greatest games in, in baseball history, and it was all on his shoulders to put the ball in play, and we score the run and win. Uh, his knees were shaking. Uh, he, he said the catcher, Greg Olson from Edina, realtor, said he, um, <laughs> yeah, it seems to be a yeah. theme. Uh, he said he couldn't even hear Greg. Greg was talking to him. Uh, what, how, did, how does someone like Gene mentally go from I'm scared to death to I got a job to do? Gene, honestly, he was a very quiet guy in the clubhouse, <laughs> not one of those guys that would get in the mix with Puckett and, and Herbeck and talking all the trash in the club out, just barbing each other. Gino was always a quiet guy, would be off to the corner, never really say too much. But if you did get him in an area that he felt like he knew, he knew what we were talking about, Gino would really go off because he's a very intelligent guy, baseball-wise, and, and a very intelligent guy off the field, book smart, the whole package. So he didn't really show a lot. But let me tell you what, he was a very smart baseball player and a very smart guy in general. Hello. There we go. Okay. <laughs> what do you think went through his mind? I mean, what do you teach players? What did you try to do when you tried to play, right? You, uh -huh. you tried to play you go. better than I tried to. <laughs> so we're not ripping on you too much. You did it a game-winning home run for the Mets. I remember that. I do remember that. Uh, however, how, did, how does a player flip from Gosh, you know what? I'm thinking about all of the what if I what if I mess up here? I'm messing up on the biggest stage in the world. What if I what if this happens? What if what if I don't come through for my team? I've got that's a lot of pressure. Your pitcher just pitched ten <laughs> innings where he refused to come out of the game, and was one of the most amazing experiences uh, we've seen in baseball. And now it's all on your shoulders. What can he do mentally to? flip that switch. Well, I think that's kind of what you talk about. You have to grab the moment and you have to take a deep breath and you have to be able to step back. And instead of panicking when you know your whole body's shaking, if you're Gene Larkin, you're standing there in that inning, I mean, it's hard to grip a bat. I mean, because the nerves, everything, the juices are flowing through, you want to get the hit, the whole package, but you got to be able to remain calm and make sure you get a pitch. Well, we that was probably our best situation to have Gene Larkin up there because he very seldom Swung out of the swung out of the batter, the, the the box. Uh, he he knew he knew the strike zone as well as anybody, and he was calm. You could see it when he was up there. He, I thought he looked calm. Uh, I don't know if he really was. I talked to him about it a few <laughs> times, and he said, "Well, it was running through me." Well, that's just normal. That's what's going to happen in that situation. Yeah, the way he described it, uh, when I interviewed him for a mindset deal, the way he described it uh, was. He had seen himself doing this over and over again. When he was preparing to hit, he already knew that Alejandro Pena, their pitcher, liked to live away in the zone, pitching away. So he knew that one, he was scared, but once he got in the batter's box, he was prepared. He had a game plan. If the ball is up and away, um, I'm letting it loose, let the big dogs eat, as Puck would say. And, and so he was in that preparation and the repetitiveness uh, calmed him down. And that's where we're at in the market coming up too, right? R repeat, 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 have the game plan, envision the success, and let it let the big dogs eat. So, Kirby, all right. So many great players that you've coached, it's unbelievable how many, but what? Minnesota did not have any winning anywhere until Puck came on the scene. For me, it looked like his attitude, the way he conducted himself, the way he included everybody, including the whole state and North and South Dakota. Uh, what can you attribute to that from him? Uh, what made him that guy? 
Puck was a little guy. And a lot of people said that you can't do this. You're not big enough to do this, uh, play baseball. And I think from the get go, and this is my opinion, I talked to Puck about things like this and he just said, you know, I dare him to try to challenge me. And, and that's who he was. He, he just knew that he could play baseball and he knew that he could do it. And when he walked in the clubhouse before a game, first getting there, when he walked in, it was a quiet clubhouse. And once he started walking over to his locker, it turned into a zoo. <laughs> and Puck talking trash, the whole package, who's pitching today, knuckleballer, oh no, I'm not playing, I can't hit a knuckleball. <laughs> it started, and everybody would get involved, and it would be just banging back at each other, back and forth, and that's when the coaches, like myself, I didn't want to get caught up with an arrow hitting me, so I would leave. <laughs> but Puck started it. Every day he walked in the clubhouse, and he was the man, and we all know that. And he just, he made everybody feel good. Everybody, the clubhouse kids. He made the coaching staff. He made us, if we screwed something up, he would make you feel good about it, right? He would say something like, well, if he was running faster, he wouldn't have been thrown out, right? I love Puck, I'm telling you, because <laughs> I got a lot of them thrown out. Uh, but Puck was just that guy. He lit the room up. If he were here standing here today, you guys would fall in love with him. I mean, he just brings that, he did. And I guarantee it, he's up in heaven right now telling people what he did and how he could put together a team right now. And he's up there, I know he is. <laughs> oh, that's so awesome. Well, you have a lot of the same attributes, though, uh, from my perspective, anyway. You, you include everybody. And this is one of, one of the things I want to get to is you come across as a fiercely loyal person. Uh, with you got clear standards. So we talked about earlier, I emulate that, and he's – from guys that play with them, one of the things they say, they knew they knew there was a line to be drawn, but they they were allowed to have a great time, and that's what I hope for for us. Uh, in fact, Keller Williams especially preferred, and you know, I think our Kirby Puckett is Olivia. Unfortunately, she's not here right now to accept that honor, but uh, she sets the tone like Kirby does, and um, it did. Uh, however. Gardy does such a great job at, at there's a fine line of what's got to get done, but let's have a blast too. And you can't keep having a blast so unless these things get done. So that's a rare combination. Um, tell us about the loyalty part first. Uh, he, tell me when you first met your coaching staff. Well, I kind of grew up with them in the minor leagues from Steve Little, Rick Anderson. Andy and I played together in double A. He was my pitching coach for all those years. And uh, his wife, Rhonda, they had a dog, a little Chihuahua, and we had a cat named Tigger. And it's just like the cartoon. Chihuahua would go after the cat, he'd run up the cat ball every day at home in Jackson, Mississippi, double A. And we lived together in triple A. And uh, uh, it, was, it was always that. He was my pitching coach, he was my confidant. I talked to him about everything all the time. And, and he was just one of the smartest guys I've been around, baseball-wise, and the pitchers, he did the hard love. I mean, they're going out there and they're not, they're not following the program, what you're supposed to do with a pitch or whatever. It would, we'd see him yelling at them, and then they would come and hug him later in the dugout. And he just had that much respect, and that's uh, one of the things that I had with my whole coaching staff. From Steve Little, you knew all these guys, we had them in the minor leagues. They were just the greatest bunch of guys. They came to the ballpark positive every day smiling, laughing, didn't matter what was going on, winning streak, losing streak. They brought it every day and they made them do their work every day. And eventually we'd find a way back and win our ball games. And it was just, I'm the manager, I'm dealing with the press and a lot of other things. So during BP, I would have to say and, and talk to the press, which is not my, I just don't, I love them. No, I don't. It's, <laughs> it's, it's just, I had to do it. That was part of my job. So my coaches like ran, ran BP, they did all that. And you have to have that. And that's part of the, you know, you hire the best people, not just your friends. And I did that. I hired the best people. They were my friends, yes. But there was a reason why I hired them, because I knew they'd get it done when I took over as manager, my coaches. You guys developed that, like you said, a long, long before. So here you are. You're handed the keys to a, a whole organization. You can pick anybody as coaches. He takes his boys from the minor leagues, because that's who he's riding in with. And that's who he's going to die with. And that's a great uh, uh, quality for all of us to have. 
However, when we were in the Ramada Inn, when we were uh, a bunch of rookies, in the, and we would have the misfortune, though, I think it was every Wednesday night, karaoke night, hearing these guys singing, <laughs> it was scary stuff. But, so no, it, was, it was, what a wonderful <laughs> <laughs> That was me. See, it gets worse. It is a wonderful world, but. Yes. We'll, we'll leave that part to Jason back there. <laughs> no, but it was just beautiful seeing seeing them mature. And then when he when he went to Detroit, who did he bring along? His people. So I just got a lot of respect for that. Another area that I think is amazing and I have a lot of respect for, and it really helped, I think, a lot of uh, young athletes realize that we're coming back to standards. You've got clear standards, but he always, I don't care where he's at, and some of you have noticed this probably from me with my mint wife uh, on social media, I'll tell you about that later. <laughs> uh, he always credits his wife and his family. He always is quick to, 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 to share with the world his love for his wife uh, and his family. And it, it, I don't know, we just didn't hear a lot of that. But when you got the round, got the, you know, here we are trying to all impress you for some reason, but, <laughs> but we would hear that. And, and I think that made guys look at life a little differently. Where did that, where did that come from for you? Can I please tell the story then about my wife? I met her, I was playing summer was ball PG? between <laughs> college seasons. I was going to the University of Texas and played some summer ball, which is called collegiate baseball in Wichita, Kansas. And uh, one of my pitchers, his wife was Carol's best friend. I'm playing pinball. It's quarter pitcher night. I've got a, court, a pitcher, a beer. I'm playing pinball, and my buddy puts me in a headlock and says, I want you to meet somebody. And it was Carol, my wife, right? And you know the stupidest thing you can do? You know what I said to her? You have disco eyes. We were at a discotheque, and I said that to her. And I'm like, that was the stupidest thing you could ever say. So, you know, ultimately, we, we started dating, and then we hung out, and we've been together 40-something years now. We quit counting. We just, honestly, we just, it's like I told you guys already that my name at home is I Just Told You. That is true. Right? I say, tell me again, please. And she says, I just told you. And so I go by that now. When she says that, I just turn and look and say, I love you. <laughs> there you have it. Oh. That's awesome. And, well, and we talk about clear standards, so a lot of times when we meet with agents and we coach is, is making sure you have clear standards, whether you're hiring somebody, uh, adding to your team, that the, the standards are clear. Talk about accountability, that's a word that we use a lot at Keller Williams. Uh, what did we say the new word was, Kelly? Support. Support. We're changing it. Accountability's gotten to be a little heavy for some people, so support. And that's what those guys would do in the dugout and badgering back and forth. They're actually holding each other accountable. So there's people, that, it's the team that holds each other accountable, and then there's the, the, the leadership group that holds everybody accountable. Um, but coming back to that, Clear standards. You also need to have clear standards for your for your life. And this is the same guy, after all his success, that he was when I first had the pleasure of meeting him in 1990. Um, this is someone who could be Lord knows where right now, having a great time doing lots of stuff. I, you can hang out with Eddie Vedder. Isn't that one of your boys? Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> well, uh, Pearl Jam, if you didn't know. Uh, but you'll just, as, this is one of my favorites. So. He, he let, it was great, he let me bring a, a child who was having brain surgery the next, in a couple days. So he let me bring him to batting practice and then uh, we met some of the Yankees guys, Twins guys, Gardy showed him around, showed him the Morno helmet that's broken that was autographed by, by Justin. We'll have to get into that. Oh geez. <laughs> so, but after all that, it was great. We're sitting there in the family section. So it's my family and his family and, and, and you know, and the young man. And next to me is a guy who's straight out of Duck Dynasty. <laughs> but everyone surrounding us were like wild players, uh, Vikings players, models. Because it's the Yankees. This is A-Rod. This is Jeter. This is the big show coming into town. So we're talking to the guy next to us. It's like, so who do you know here? Oh, I'm Gardy's fishing buddy. <laughs> <laughs> like, really? Yep, he flew me in from Oklahoma. <laughs> so it hit me. I'm sitting here. 
all these people got all this flash and stuff going on, and he, he has a, a, a family who's having brain surgery, and what's his name? I don't even remember. Do you know who I'm talking about? Maybe not. I, I just told you so. <laughs> <laughs> I can't remember yet. I awkwardly feel married to you. <laughs> <laughs> but that see that just tells you that he has certain standards that he doesn't negotiate, right? Where do you think that comes from? I mean, you grew up. Uh, uh, your father was in in the army. Yes. So you grew up in Oklahoma, uh, just like my dad. My dad grew up in Oklahoma in the army, so that's another reason he he always talked about guardian. Uh, but where did where do you feel that came from? You like you said you you know how you want to live your life. You know how you want to treat people. And you just don't seem to waver. Well, I, I think that's kind of trying to be consistent. My dad was military. You had to be consistent around him. It was always, yes, ma'am, and yes, sir. And that's just the way we were brought up. I mean, it's just the way it was going to be. Uh, and there was he was a tough little guy, but it, he was an Army guy. And we grew up, if, if you were supposed to be home at 530, you don't come home at 531. You might as well just stay down at the park, right? Because <laughs> probably get this little bitty belt about that wide on your butt. But that's, we all knew it and respected it, and he had all the respect. And, you know, I always told myself, you know, I, I want to be a Major League Baseball player and all those things, but uh, I think coaching was just something we all did when we played. We would go down to the park and play football, and we'd have a huddle, and I'd be calling plays out, like, I have no clue what I'm doing in football. But it was just what we did, and it was all about respect when you went down there and played. Not to kill your friends, right? But respect when you're playing a football game or a baseball game or whatever, and that's what my dad, he was all about that. It was totally all about that. Well, that's awesome. We would try to kill our friends. But yeah. <laughs> maybe we were just a little more inappropriate fishes. But that being said, so I'd like to come back to to something about adversity. Um, you talked about how many people have done this. In fact, I don't know if this ever happened. Sorry to bring this up, but it, uh -oh. not a bad thing. It's not a bad thing. It's going to happen uh, over the time. Uh, you, you managed for the Twins for 13 years. That morning, he has a discussion with the general manager. They decide that the Twins are going to move on. They just decide they need a different voice. They had a different group of players coming up that maybe weren't congruent with the style of play that, that the standard that you have is probably a lot the way I envisioned it. Um, he showed up at the press conference that day next to the general manager answering questions. So all of us here have been fired by clients or whatever it might be, but how many of us want to show up in an interview in front of a bunch of cameras to talk about it? I just would like some insight as to what made what what scruples or what made you decide to do that. It would have been easy to just walk away, let the twins hold the press conference, and so I'd just love for you to speak in that because it's one of the most impressive things I've seen. Well, I, it was hard. It was a hard time. You know, I I love Terry Ryan, and him and I were really close. We both had bald heads, uh, <laughs> and he's a GM, and I took still my hat off and rub it all the time. As I still do, but uh, it was all about respect for Terry and. He, had, he was crying when he told me, I'm getting fired, right? Now I'm tearing up now. Okay, so he was honestly, honestly crying up in his office. So then we go down to the press conference. I couldn't let him go down there by himself. I've been the manager there and a coach for 23 years. It's not just, okay, I walk out the door and go home. So the hardest thing for me during that whole process was my kids were sick. That killed me, right? But Terry Ryan was crying the whole time. So I'm having a hard time trying to, to let go and it just wouldn't do it right i'm trying to be the tough guy that was the hardest moment in my life i've never been fired before from anything and terry ryan did not want to fire me but he knew it was the right thing to do for the organization he was doing the right thing because i'd gotten stale a little bit uh, my programs weren't working with some of the new wave new high draft picks and it was time to make a change but it it was the hard one of the hardest things i've been around but the best part of that whole press conference was Sid Hartman sitting up front and all we're talking and I'm trying to talk about how much I appreciated everything and Sid Hartman stands up and says, I gotta go, the Timberwolves are doing, making a move. Right in the middle of my press conference. <laughs> <laughs> so that just kind of took everything away from me, you know, all sticky and everything. We were all laughing and there went Sid running out the door. <laughs>
See, that's also the beauty. That wasn't planned, but especially when you're dealing with a sport like baseball and real estate, there's a lot of failure that goes on. So you do need those valves. You need, you need to let the pressure out, right? You need to let the pressure out. So you guys know I like to joke around a lot, and it's really to keep things light. Um, if, I, if I'm not joking around enough, then you know I'm going too deep and rip on me and do something to me to make me get out of that <laughs> mindset. But, but seriously, that was one of the most impressive things. Of course, Ron went on to be a coach with the Diamondbacks and then also a manager with Detroit. Um, what, but how, what would, in your mindset from what you learned in the game, how did you make that adjustment from, okay, this organization I love dearly and now you're a Hall of Famer? By the way, that's impressive. But let's give him a round for that. And if anyone saw his speech, he even had uh, flight attendants there from when they flew uh, around. He had everybody there except me. He had <laughs> every, everybody there. And Michael. it was, no, you're, you're, why would you? Um, you know, it would have been so odd. <laughs> I didn't even told about it throwing you into the pool. Um, I don't even know if you remember that. Probably not. Right. <laughs> Maybe we'll get into that. But, but, but it, what, how did you flip out of that mindset? You still wanted to manage. How, how long did it take you? And really, what did you do mentally to, to make that next adjustment? Well, I, I got a phone call. I've been let go by the twins. I really wasn't doing anything. I was down at Fort Myers. And, and uh, uh, all of a sudden it was Tori Lavelle, and he was named the new manager of the Arizona Diamondbacks. And I, I think this is, it was really cool. I've never had anybody really ask me to do that, but he wanted me to be his bench coach out in Arizona. And I'm like, where is Arizona, all right? And I'm thinking, I don't want, it's not out there. So he talked me into it. We had a couple of different phone calls and I went to Arizona as the bench coach. And uh, we won, we went all the way to the National League Championships. And, I was only there one year when I left driving down interstate, whatever it would be, 10 or 75, going towards Oklahoma. And I get a phone call from Boston Red Sox. They want to interview me. And then I get a phone call from the Detroit Tigers and they want to interview me. So I was going, oh, I'm in trouble now. I might have to manage again and end up taking the job with, with Detroit. I had a blast. I knew it was going to be a rebuild. And Al Avila, general manager over there, a little bit of Cuban guy, Funniest guy I've ever been around in my life and we had a ball. We weren't great, but we really played and I got to manage Miguel Cabrera and, and, and A couple other guys that I really respected from the other side. So it turned out pretty good But you know you get fired you get fired you just move on and then I did that and my wife She just didn't want to be around me that much. That's the problem You got to stay in baseball. You are not around your wife for the whole summer You very you see them after you come home from a road trip. So then you get in their way when you're home. <laughs> they know all the shopping places. They know everything, right? Where are we going to dinner? It's a day off. Uh, we're going to go to the Italian place. And I had no say so in it. She would tell me where we're going, and that's the way it was. But that was all different, all new, uh, because she, I was around her. And she, I don't think she was comfortable. She's not really comfortable now that I retired. She's, she goes on walks all the time. <laughs> So, no, I, just, I ramble sometimes. Oh, no, that's good stuff. Now I, I realize how much my wife goes on walks. No, <laughs> <laughs> tell, tell signs. They're probably she's probably with Carol. <laughs> so, coaching. So everyone here is a coach, meaning some some are in leadership coaching, um, but every agent is a coach of their 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 clients. What would be some of the major, I mean, think about it. I mean, you got, you're handed the keys to a major league franchise. You're looking at all these young faces and, and you're going, what the heck do I do now? What, what are the main tenets throughout a season, throughout any coaching that you've done that you made sure that you employed uh, along that time? I think you just, in, you get to know people. You, you come over to a new, baseball club or you guys come into a new business with other people, you have to get to know them. You have to find out who they are. Find out where they've been, what they've done, and, and ask questions because that's really important. And it makes it always makes me feel good when people do that to me. Ask me questions about what do you think? And I know that's what that's how it should be because 
you're getting into something and you're a little afraid and you're nervous, you're, you know, is it gonna work? Am I doing something wrong? I'm leaving one job, going to another, but just find out, get to know the people around you and start asking questions, they'll help you. And that's kind of what we do in baseball. A new player comes from another team, that's what I do. I'd call him in my office, say, what do you got? What happened over there? And they would tell me, well, I got screwed, right? Well, you're gonna get screwed over here if you don't get any hits, right? And they would, <laughs> they would laugh, so I've already broke the ice. I just told them, you know, if you don't hit here, you'll get screwed here, right? So, hey, throw all that away and go out and play the game and get after it and we'll see what happens. And that's what I would tell players. I didn't promise them anything. Uh, I just told them the way it was, was there. This is, you'll get playing time when you prove that you can play. And I will give you an opportunity. Well, that's what you're gonna find out. You're gonna find people that can help you in your, in your job, in your business, and you're gonna find out all about them. That's what you should do. And then you can go from there, trying to figure out how we can all make it work as a team uh, and as a group. And that's, that's kind of the way it works for me. That's awesome. And, and I'd imagine sometimes you have players that they're in a massive slump. They've got a hot mess going on at home and you know life's falling apart because it happens to everybody. You've got that young player in your office. What, what kind of, or you, it could just be a guy who's in a slump and pressure himself. What advice or mindset tricks did you give them, or what did you try to do for that kind of person? Golly, I, I, I would tell them, it's not your fault, son. It's the scout that signed you, right? <laughs> That's one of the first things I would say to a player. Son, we're gonna send you down. It's not your fault, it's the scout that signed you. So all of a sudden, I've broken everything loose. Now they're smiling. And they're calling me a little bit of a name when they walk out. And I said, you go down there and play, and you get your butt back up here because I like you. But you got to throw something at them that makes them go, ooh, right? And some of them didn't even understand what I said when I said it, right? <laughs> but that's, I wanted them to come in my office, not shaky. Come in my office, knock on the door, sit down, what do you got? They, I had people say things to me, and I'm wanting. I have never, ever heard of something like that. I can't do that for you. You have to do it for yourself. And it's just little things. But I heard stuff from players, and believe me, I got ripped. I got ripped by players when we send a guy down that actually you know, went three for four the night before, but it's a roster thing, and it's, uh, we got a guy coming off the DL, so somebody has to go. So I have to make that decision. Talk to the general manager, and we're gonna send the guy out. It's miserable. This guy just went three for four, he's been killing the ball. But we're bringing back a guy off the DL, and he's gonna be playing there, so you need to go to AAA and keep playing. Those are the hardest things you do as a manager on a day-to-day -day basis because you're looking in the eyes of these guys and they care. It's their career, it's their life. It's not just baseball, this is their life. So you're looking in their eyes and you can see them. They're well enough, the whole package. I had times when guys walked out there, I, was, I felt terrible, terrible. But the GM was standing right there with me and he was the one making me do it. And I'm not gonna blame the GM, but he runs the roster, I don't. So. Is that okay? <laughs> sure. I'm just trying to think. I can't blame the GM, so I'm trying to think of who I could blame. With that. I was trying to remember if I ever had you in my office and told you you're going down. No. no. Uh, TK did those three times. Uh, yeah, let's just leave it there. No, but I tell you what, coming back to you, well, the twins, the twins way with you, you've mentioned Terry Ryan. Terry's like a second dad to me. Um, he was the general manager. Uh, the parallels between the Twins away, I can't speak for it as well now because I just don't know the people there anymore as much, but this company and especially this brokerage is very much, it's like, that's why I feel so comfortable here is it's about uh, being fundamentally sound, especially as the market's changing. It's getting more and more important to get back to, okay, let's let's make sure we're hitting off the tee every day. Let's, you know, we're taking all the ground balls. We're doing the basics that, that realtors need to do more often, more, more role play so that you're on your game when you're talking with people. Um, and in the twins, it's, it's the care they have. And, and, and we've got a bunch of people here that have massive hearts and uh, do a lot in their community. And how do you, uh, how would you say, I, I'm just curious, how do you think the twins became that way? You were a big part of that because you were there for all those years. Um, TK obviously was a big part of it, and Puck came in. There was just a different level of family. They promote from within. Uh, that's what Keller Williams does. 
you know, how do, where do you attribute that to, and what do you think its impact is? Well, I, I think there's, you gotta, in business, in life, you have to find your path. You have to find what makes, what's gonna make you move forward and go. And the twins way was, we know we're not gonna spend a ton of money. Uh, so now we have to be better than the rest of them. That's free agents and drafting players. And they drafted for the years that I was there as well as anybody. We got tons of talented players. And then when you have all that in the minor leagues, you can flip them when you have a chance to win and flip a couple of young prospects and get a really good hitter or a really good pitcher to get you over the hump. The Twins did that as well as anybody. Terry Ryan was great. Andy McPhail was unbelievable, really intelligent, really smart. Uh, but they worked very hard. And here's, here was the key for me. Those guys were not afraid to come down to my office and sit in my office with me and just have a conversation, not even about baseball. They loved being around it. They appreciated baseball, but that wasn't their whole life. It was what they did, but they loved coming down and hearing stories and talking in the clubhouse. And I appreciated that a lot. Just them coming around saying, hey, you're doing fine, don't worry about it. Because when we started having troubles at the end, Terry was the one taking all the heat. They were leaving me alone until my, like my last year. Then they ripped me pretty good. And I, and I earned it. I deserved it. I couldn't figure out how to make us win. But Terry was taking all the heat. And that's why we would sit down and talk about it. What can we do to make it better? We can, we're not, they're not, our budget is done. We can't spend any money. How do you make it better? You draft better again. You go back to the basics. You make good draft picks. Now your choices are higher. You're getting an earlier draft pick because you've lost. So you start making good choices again and you build it right back over again. And that's making good choices. And the Twins have been fantastic at it. They have a nice ball club now, and they're, they're talented, they're drafting well, and they have a lot of prospects. I know that because my son, you know, manages in AAA, he's in Major League Camp with them, and he knows, he, he tells me. I got a Twins player from him because my son told him, Dad, they might take him off the roster. You want to get this guy. We brought him over to, Men to Detroit. He became one of my players, <laughs> right? But do. Right? Oh yeah. We got him. And that's because Toby told me, and I told the Tigers, this guy's going to be available. And there, of course, we were like really high, and we took him. And he's still playing over there for Detroit. And that's kind of the way it went, family. My son, thank you very much. Made me look a little better. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. Uh, one of the things we wanted to touch on, too, is uh, I remember spring training, uh, it, we went to Tampa, played the Yankees. Uh, da uh, David Wells was pitching. He's a really tough lefty, and I'm a lefty. And I was really nervous and scared because you have to, if you don't know a fastball, if it comes here, you got to wait and, and see if, if it's going to break. You can't just duck. Otherwise, you look really stupid. But if it's coming here and it's a fastball, <laughs> you really will look stupid. <laughs> and I was good at that. But I could hear Kirby Puckett yelling from the dugout. Uh, he said, uh, well, which one did he say to me? It was, hey, Augie, go, go see the wizard. You need some c -c -c courage. <laughs> <laughs> so, totally called me out in front of the, everybody, basically saying, in, in a nice way, saying, what are you scared about? You know, or he'd say, go get a dog. You know? But speak into that, because I mean, that did relax me. That made me reset and I still didn't do great, but I, I did it confidently. <laughs> but talk about fear and dealing with it and that mindset to help people get beyond the fear. I, 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 don't, I, don't know, I don't know if you should want to get beyond the fear. I think that drives you a little more. The fear of failure is probably your biggest fear, right? You don't want to just screw something up. And, so I think that drives you. I think you need that. I, I have fear. Every time I walk into the kitchen, my wife says, what are you doing? That's fear. I respect that, right? And, and I'm telling you, that's the way it is. That fear is not a bad thing. Fear is good because now it makes you concentrate more. It makes you really start thinking about things more. And you'll probably be a better salesman. You'll probably be a better rep. The whole package, because that fear drives you. You don't want to screw something up. And that's baseball in general. That was me when I batted, right? I didn't want somebody to see me buckle on a curveball, which I did all the time, right? Mm -hmm. Swinging a ball that bounced in front of home plate. And that was the fear factor in me. 
And then every once in a while, I'd stay back and whack a baseball and be running around the bases and go say hi to Pete Rose at second base. God, it didn't get any better than that, but it was fear. You don't want to screw up and you don't want to let anybody down. I think that's a good thing. I think that drives you. I think that is one of the things that can really drive you is you have to have some of that fear that I don't want to screw something up. I might lose my job, but you might be the boss too, right? That's the positive side of it. So fear is good. I, I don't have a problem with that. I think that we live with it when you're playing baseball. Awesome. Well, one of the things that helps us deal with it in advance, right, is, is preparation and discipline. Uh, who, who is the most prepared? What, what I mean is, is if you are feeling anxious and are feeling the fear, it's about getting down to those basics and making progress, making calls and getting those relationships built deeper. And again, by the way, if you're great with, like with relationships and you need a new job, people are calling you, right? In his case, because he was a great person, did a great job. So that's gonna happen with you too. But what I'm saying is, is basically, who is the most prepared player that you can think of? Uh, because again, so that to counteract fear or concern, we just feel preparation is key. Oh boy, there's, there's so many, you know, you're, you're around so many different players. I can tell you the one guy that I never saw him sweat, Joe Maurer. There's no doubt. He never looks like he's rushing to do anything. He makes everything look easy. And I've walked up to him a thousand times saying, it's not that easy, Joe. It's really not that easy. What you do, you let that ball travel and you flip it out to left field. It's not that easy. This game is not that easy. And he made it look really easy. Catching the whole package. And he's handsome. And he's got a lot of money. He's got a beautiful family. I respect that guy because he was a guy that came in prepared every day, a big kid, tall catcher. Not always you can, can't get away with that. He did it for a lot of years, took a lot of beat, and, but he still hit. He still hit every year, and he's truly, and he'll tell you, one of the night, you, if, if you've met him, he's not fake. In any way, he's fake. Uh, he is a real deal, uh, as a person goes, because he cares. He will look you in the eye when you go up and say, how you doing, Joe? He's not gonna look away from you and look at who else is over there. He's Joe, and I'm telling you, he's, he's one of the best I've met around. Uh, a couple other guys, Kirby Puckett was great. Uh, Torrey Hunter, he was a gangster. He was a gangster. He would tell us he's a gangster. So if a baseball fight broke out, you might get hit by a Torrey Hunter, right? He would flat out tell you. But he had a passion too. He got people playing the game. And he didn't, if a guy didn't run a ball out, he, Tory would come over to me and say, I got it, I got it. And then Corey would have that guy in the corner. So I didn't have to worry about yelling at a guy because he didn't run a ball, I didn't hustle. Tory had it. Those are the people that you live by, right? Those are the people that will take care of stuff and make sure it doesn't go any farther than that. And the next time they hit a ball, they're gonna run because Tory Hunter said so, right? Not me, I stayed out of it. I didn't want him mad at me. Tory Hunter didn't care. He told me one day, I'm a gangster. You know that, Gary. I'm a gangster. I said, Tory, I don't really know what that means, right? But I'm going to tell you, I'll let you be a gangster as long as you keep policing that clubhouse. That's fine with me. And those guys, those two guys right there, they had that respect of everybody. Everybody in the clubhouse. And that was because they cared. They really cared. And they would go to the end of the earth to help you or do what you need done. And thank you for sharing that. We have that here. We have some team leaders, uh, you know, rainmakers, uh, people in this office that that are always looking to help other people. And that's someone else's business. I mean, it, it's, I mean, it doesn't help them a ton, but they, they still step up and do it. They're the ones that are running off those ground balls to the pitcher. I see it every day and I'm honored and actually awed by how much work you all put in. But it sounds like, yeah, with the preparation and discipline, but before we open it up and it's getting a little long in the tooth here, I wanna give some people some quick, I was supposed to ask a question from someone who can't be here today um, because the story was, by the way, in, in 1990, it was instructional league and some of the, it was Guardy's birthday, it was the last day before they flew out and the coaches told us rookies to go throw Guardy into the pool. So we threw him in the pool. <laughs> and he comes back out and he says, all right, guys, this is my last clean clothes. I gotta fly out tomorrow, so don't do it again. So coach, coach just said, go throw him in again. 
right. You probably don't even remember that. I was probably drunk. That's what I was thinking. That's what I was thinking. We're flying out. I always get drunk. So the next next spring training, uh, I'm in the it's Ramadi Inn. I left the room, and my, my roommate's sitting there, and um, you were walking by saying hi to everybody. And apparently it went down like this. Hey, who's your roommate? Ogden. Oh, that's so good. <laughs> and you flipped my end of the room upside down. My bed was all over the place, and all my, my clothes were dumped all over. So I come back to the, my, my room, and I, I called the front desk. I got, I've been robbed, because <laughs> my roommate wasn't there. So you didn't even know that part, because you know, we almost had the cops showing up. I, my roommate showed up, oh, that was just parody. I said, well, let's, let's still call the cops. <laughs> But the last question is in that line of light is, what's the best baseball prank of your career? <laughs> oh, geez. I kind of did a lot of that stuff. I, I'd have to really think back. We did, we did a lot of pranking in baseball. There's just so much downtime and, you know, you just come up with all kinds of things. We, you know, I guess probably not a great one, but Jerry White, one of my coaches, uh, loved the guy. He's one of my dearest friends in the world. Uh, Terry, Terry Steinbeck came over to the Twins. Somebody had hit a raccoon on the way to the ballpark. Jerry White is deathly afraid of animals, right? And he drove, he drove, he has this old Ford pickup truck and they put it on the windshield wiper. So when Jer we were all standing out there at the old Metrodome at the top. And so Jerry turns, starts his car, you know, he's looking down. He's always got paperwork and all this stuff, and all of a sudden, they turned, the windshield wipers came on and it hit the raccoon. And Jerry, he took off running. He just left his car, he took off running. And we were crying laughing. I'm like, don't, please don't let anybody know about that. We can all go to prison. <laughs> that was probably one of the best I'd say. You guys had something with animals, because you guys would get your, uh, rough, your chairs and sit down outside uh, the hotel room and you'd have your BB guns, so you'd have your six pack, your BB guns, and you'd pick off geckos. <laughs> you'd pick geckos off the, you can't know, you can't know that yet. BB guns. <laughs> BB guns, you'd pick geckos off the wall and then someone would go shake the, the garbage bin and so hope a rat would come out and shoot it. <laughs> that was West Palm Beach, instructionally. Yeah. And we did, we actually did that. Those things would be going way up and we'd see if we could shoot them with BB guns. And we could have gone to jail if they would have seen us probably, but we were, we would hide. I've got video evidence. Yeah. But uh, who's got it? Let's get a couple questions in before we address this. Wow. I don't know how you can address this. In uh, sports, you hear the expression frequently, take the game to the next level. And in real estate, we talk about systems, models, uh, scripts and dialogues, um, and there's an expression called going from E to P. E is what you do naturally, and P is what you do on purpose. Did, did you ever, or, or were you ever around a player that purposefully, maybe wasn't a huge talent, but disciplined themselves to become a much better player because they stuck to a schedule, uh, we talk about time blocking, certain hours of the day you do certain things. Did you ever know a player like that? Well, we had, I guess we say it's a little different. Well, the superstitions in baseball were big. It's not so much that it's superstitions if the guy gets a hit and he reached down and pulled his pants leg down and he's gonna do it again, right? And that was kind of one, that's one of the big baseball theories if you get a hit with one bat and then you get another hit with that bat and then you break the bat, you're screwed. <laughs> so it's all, all that in baseball. Every day you see it, you know, a guy wearing the same glove, uh, you can't touch his batting gloves. The clubhouse kids, you know, run out there and grab the gloves when they walk. They don't want them to do anything with them at six. Set them right on the bench, right here, right here. So baseball's full of that. And that's kind of, you know, where we went. Um, the hazing, we didn't get into that. There's a lot of trouble in the hazing, but when I first broke in, oh, there was hazing. Yeah, these people used to wear us out, and make you do things, you know, uh, just so you're one of them. 
and that got kicked out, which was really good when I first started playing. That was not a good thing, believe me, because these guys were psychos. Jamie probably, I would guess that he got hazed about 15 times. <laughs> That's just at home. <laughs> Speaking of hazing types, Dean has a question. So you were rejected. Uh, you were ejected 73 times in your career. Dejected or re-ejected? <laughs> <laughs> I have no question. I just want to tell you that. <laughs> just let me set the story straight. Okay? I, I would say probably 80% of me getting thrown out of the game was so my players would stay in the game. The players would start barking at an umpire and he would turn and start walking then I would fly out and I would ultimately turn all the yelling at me and I would get in an argument and you know tell him listen you know I don't know why you're even out here you're not very good right <laughs> <laughs> see ya right that type of thing. but I got to go watch TV and I got to watch the game on TV and have a beer during the game when I got thrown out. So it wasn't that bad of a deal. It did cost me a lot of money, though. It was like $2,500, $5,000, depending on how far you went and how many umpires kicked you out and one, you know. So anyway, it was, it's, it's just, it is, but uh, we protect each other in the clubhouse and the players are young guys. We know when they've had their limit because you don't want fights, which we had that too. Guy's giving a guy grief, and next thing you know, he takes a swing at you. That's just when guys are together, as long as we are, baseball season. You're going to have one of those every once in a while, and really, it's not. It, we don't want anybody to get hurt, but it's not a bad thing, because that's showing passion to us. He's going to fight for what he thinks right, and then you'll take them both in there, and they hug and kiss, and then they go out. <laughs> you, you'll get it smoothed down somewhere or another, but it's, sometimes those things are not bad. It's really not bad to have, because maybe they get a little more focused on baseball rather than each other. So did you ever then go and hug and kiss the ump after to <laughs> and make up with them? Mm -hmm. No. No. All right. <laughs> Kelly. I'm just wondering, with all your years in, in baseball, what's something that you're most proud of? Uh, wow, that's a tough one. My kids, without a doubt. My son is managing the St. Paul Saints. He's done very well for himself. My middle daughter's down in Oklahoma. I have three grandbabies down there on a farm. I got a farm for them, so baseball's, you know, gifted me with being able to do some of those things. And then my youngest daughter, Tara, is in the healthcare business, and uh, she lives here in, uh, up here in the Twin Cities in Oakdale. And I'm just so proud of them because they're all doing different. They all went to college, and they're all doing different things, and they've made lives for themselves. And now Carol and I are free. <laughs> <laughs> We're free. So, and we still go to see them, but. When you go see your grandkids now, like go to Oklahoma and see them, we have our RV there parked. We go to the RV and the grandkids stay inside. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Here, one more quick question, then we'll move forward. Ooh, we were pretty excited to see earlier this year that you bought a new house in Minnesota. Yes, we did. Have you settled in and was it a hard decision to mm -hmm. pick that one? It was really simple because it's right next to Oak Mark Golf Course, Oak Marsh. It's right next door and my whole goal in my life since I retired, is to have a golf cart in my garage with my clubs on it, and I can drive right down and tee off. And I'm working on that one with Steve down there at Oak Marsh. I think he's gonna let me do it. Uh, there's a golf hole that I could go to, it's a par three, and I could just go on around the rest of the way. And I really wanna do that. That's one of my goals in life. <laughs> my wife's not on it, but that's <laughs> And if you were the realtor who listed that house, please stand up. Stand up. Woo! Yeah. Great price too. Great price. <laughs> we don't want to hear that. No, but all right. Well, it, we're gonna wrap it up. But what, what we'll do is we'll have a time when we get in line and you guys take pictures with Ron and, and, and autographs. It. This is the kind of guy he is. Again, I, I asked him. I reached out. Actually, my son originally reached out to you, which he had time to talk to my son, which tells you a lot of his character too, because um, I don't, no. <laughs> but uh, uh, so I said, okay, Gary, this is great. He's gonna come in and he's gonna pour into you guys and you guys pour into a lot of people. So it's great use of his time. And so I'm like, well, what can we get you? He's like, you know me, Ox, beer. <laughs> I'm thinking gift card, I'm thinking a check, you know, just something. Uh, and I'm like, okay, well, what kind of beer? And he says, 
Cold and wet. That's <laughs> cold and wet, Rocky Mountains. It's cold and wet right here. Oh, wow, you got them all. You got all kinds right Holy here. Yeah. Yeah. So, so this, this is really, this is four times as much as what he asked for. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, but so anyway, real quick, before we, before we all get in line and, and have special time with each other with, with Ron, I just want to, just want to say thanks. That, thanks. You know, the baseball thing is, baseball's a vehicle. Real estate's a vehicle. It's a vehicle to touch lives. It's a vehicle to make a difference in this world. And you've done it as good as anyone I've known. Thanks. So, thanks. Let's give him a round of applause. Thanks. So, well, thank right. you guys for humoring me and letting me tell a few stories and talk a little baseball. I know what you guys do is really hard. Like I said, my wife did real estate thing for a while, and that was like kind of like being in baseball. I'm gone half the time. Well, she was gone a lot. And I talked to her about, about it a lot. We're gonna move so you can't do real estate anymore. <laughs> so, uh, I know how hard you work. I know how hard it is out there with the market and it goes up and down and fluctuates, but thank you. Thank you for what you do. You guys work really hard and you take care of people like myself and Carol, where we can find a house in Minnesota <laughs> and not go broke. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. Let's get that line formed again. Let's go.